Bow our heads in silent preparation as we prepare for the teaching of God's Word. Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you again for your love for us. We thank you for your promises in the Word of God. You promised us that you will never leave us or forsake us. And Lord, help us to um, walk in fellowship with you, Lord, and seek to do your will. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the just shall live by faith as we sung in this hymn, Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And when the world opposes us, help us to lift up the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith, Lord. Father, we pray, Lord, that we might take in the word of God by faith and grow in your grace. Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things out of your word. Sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. I think we left off around verse 6. Um, but in this section of Scripture, we start to see outward open opposition against the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, this chapter begins with a mentioning of Jews who wanted to kill him. There was a Feast of Tabernacles, which normally Jewish males would attend. Jesus, being in Galilee, would travel down to Jerusalem to participate in the feast. But he delayed, and the delay here was for a reason. The delay was because there were those who were seeking to take his life. And therefore, the timing was important. He eventually ended up at the feast, but in the middle of the week, in the middle of the week of the feast. But his family, not understanding God's purpose for the Son of God to die on the cross for our sins and to die before then, would not fulfill God's plan and purpose. They advised him that if you're the Messiah, make yourself openly known. Show yourself. Then the world, everyone will see who you are and believe. Well, the problem with, with that is that his own brothers did not believe in him. And thinking that their own logic is contradictory. Now, of course, they said that, uh, I think, in a facetious way, in verse 4, no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. But they're doing so out of an attitude of unbelief. Uh, now, we saw later that his bro we last week we dealt with his brothers and the fact that, at least that we know, two brothers came to faith and believing that Jesus is the Messiah more than likely after the resurrection, uh, Jude, certainly one of those uh, believers, and uh, James was the second one. Both of them wrote letters, epistles. Now, what was Jesus' response to his brother's uh, request to go down to Jerusalem, do a miracle, show yourself publicly, and people will you know, flock to you, basically? Verse 6 says, Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come. But your time is always ready. Think about that. My time has not yet come. I don't want to circumvent the plan of God by going down there early, being killed, and then circumventing the purpose of him going to the cross. I'm not going to do bypass God's plan. What's interesting here is some people today have a hyper view of sovereignty. And their hyper view of sovereignty means it doesn't matter what I do, no matter what circumstances I do, that um, I can even act foolishly and God will protect me. Now, God may do so, but that's not always the case. God still has allowed, he, and his plan has allowed free volition. And that included the Son of God as well. And therefore, he understandingly, that people wanted to kill him, would not put his life in jeopardy before it was his time. Now, it would be his time, within a matter of nine months or so. We have this fall in September, then he's killed in the spring, crucified in the spring. So within a year, it would be God's plan for Christ to be crucified. But it wasn't at this point. It was not at this point. And uh, so he says in verse 5, we'll re begin reading here in verse 5. We'll read down through verse 9. Um, or verse 6. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast. 
Secondly, he said, my time has not yet fully come. He said it twice. When he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Remained in Galilee. All right. So, his time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Now, let's take a look at that phrase. That phraseology is repeated throughout the Gospel of John uh, about the timing of the Son of Man to die and certainly to be crucified. Uh, Jesus, when he turned water into wine, he told his mother in verse 4 in John chapter 2, Woman, what does, you, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And then later on in John chapter 7, verse 30, John 7, verse 30, Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. John chapter 8, verse 20. John 8, verse 20. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. John chapter 12, verse 23. John 12, 23. Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He's anticipating at this point. This is a triumphal entry, by the way. So he's within a week, less than a week of his death. So he finally says, now my hour has arrived. This is the time that God has called me to, to, for the, to, to die for the sins of the whole world. So this is the time. Now is the time. So he said at that point, my hour has come. And notice here in verse 27, John 12, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. You know, Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served and give his life a ransom for many. He said, this is my mission. This is my purpose. And now I'm facing that hour. Notice in verse chapter 13, verse 1, he's washing his disciples' feet in the upper room right before his crucifixion. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Here it's anticipating his ascension. So that would include his death, resurrection, and eventually ascension. All those things would shortly come to pass. Um, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. It's a great passage on the faithfulness of the Lord in spite of the betrayal of the disciples. Chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven. And here's his high priestly pr prayer and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. Now is the time for me to fulfill the plan and mission that you call me to fulfill. So at this point, he says, that hasn't occurred yet. So I'm not going to be foolish, certainly. I'm going to trust God, but I'm not going to be foolish in going down early when there's Jews that want my death at this point. No. Uh, one writer puts it this way. I think this is uh, yeah, Bob Wilkin. This is his comment. He said, the word time here, my time has not yet come, is a different word from the word hora in 2.4. Thus Jesus may not be repeating the point he made to his mother that his glorification by the cross was not yet at hand. When he says, my time has not yet come, he may simply be saying that it was not yet his time for him to go back to Jerusalem. For his brothers, however, they could go to Jerusalem at any time they wanted. No one was seeking to kill them. But I think the idea also is that the mission for him to go to the cross was not yet. Now, Jesus, oh, by the way, I want to finish out. Your time is already ready. It's always ready. You can go at any time, but I'm going to stay here in Galilee. Verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. If you're a born again believer, one thing is very true of you. The world hates you. You ever think about that? If you're part of the world, 
Uh, if you're part of the world, the world would love its own. But if you come out of the world and you're a believer, especially if you're a believer that practices biblical truth, you will be the opposition of hatred. And in that sense, we can identify with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why does the world hate him? You think, you know, Jesus was loving, he was kind, he healed people, uh, he wanted to save people. Um, why would the world hate them? Because they are in re rebellion against a holy God. And therefore, its actions are evil, are evil. The light hates the darkness. The dark, or darkness hates the light. Uh, Jesus said that earlier in John chapter 1. Now, what is the world? A lot of people don't know that word world. If you say that you're a worldly person or you have worldly thinking, what does that mean? Well, we have to realize that the word world here is the Greek word cosmos. And the Greeks use this word of an orderly arrangement. The basic meaning of cosmos is an orderly arrangement. And therefore, we can look at the planets and sun, moon, and stars, and we call that the cosmos, the orderly arrangement. There's an order, design. Um, but the idea, it means an orderly arrangement. Now, biblically speaking, in the context here is, the world system, we would call it, would be an orderly arrangement headed up by Satan with hostility toward God's plan and his agenda. We call that the world system. And therefore, the cosmos and everything that belongs to it appears as that which is hostile to God. So the world is the system of evil organized under Satan's leadership that opposes the truth and things of God. This world system is lost in sin. It's wholly at odds with anything divine. This world system is ruined and depraved. Schaefer coined the term cosmos diabolicus. Cosmos diabolicus. And this is what Cha how Schaefer defined the world. Now normally you think of a world as the way people dress, the way people talk or act, that's worldly. Normally you point to dress, but that person may not be worldly, may dress differently as far as style, but may not be worldly. That's not a definition of worldliness. It goes much deeper than that. It's far more extensive than that. Uh, the cosmos, Chafer said, is a vast order or system that Satan has promoted. Remember, he is the head of this cosmic system. Uh, just like uh, Goebbels was the propaganda minister in the time of Germany, World War II Germany, promoting mis disinformation. Satan is promoting disinformation against biblical truth in various ways. He does it through religion. He does it through the arts. He does it through music. He does it through the educational system. Uh, all these are various ways that Satan promotes anti-truth. And that's part of this cosmic system. I'm going back to the Chafer's definition. The cosmos is a vast order system that Satan has promoted, which conforms to his ideals, aims, and methods. It is a civilization now functioning apart from God, a civilization which none of its promoters really expect God to share, who assign to God no consideration and respect to their projects. God's out of the picture in what they do. God's out of the picture. See? Nor do they ascribe any causivity to the hymn. Their system embraces its godless governments, conflict, armaments, jealousies, its education, culture, religions of morality, and pride. It is the spirit in which man lives. It is what he sees, what he employs. To the uncounted multitude, it is all that they ever know so long as they live on this earth. It is properly styled the satanic system, which phrase in its many instances, a justified interpretation of the so meaningful word cosmos. It is literally a cosmos diabolicus. So, first thing we know about the cosmos is Satan is the ruler of this system of evil. Satan's in charge of this. Several passages along that line. Uh, let's take a look at John 14, verse 30. John 14, 30. 
I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Now obviously he can't be speaking of God because Christ is a relationship with God. The ruler of the world there is Satan. Ruler of the world is Satan. Ruler of this world system. Um, John chapter 16 verse 11. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to convict the unsaved of their need for Christ. And he says here of judgment because the ruler of the world is judge. He's anticipating the judgment of Satan with Christ's death on the cross. But notice he called Satan the ruler of this cosmos ruler of the world. I think one of the clearest passages in, is in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, um, verse 19. We know that we are of God in the whole world. This world system lies under the sway of the wicked one. Uh, he is the puppet master, if you want to put it that way. Satan pulls the strings of disinformation and truth and rebellion against God. He's in charge of this system of evil that takes various forms. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, when Satan offered him the kingdoms of the world, notice he offered these things to Jesus, but Jesus refused certainly. Again, the devil took him up to the exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Now, Luke's gospel indicates that those have been handed over to him. It's very important because Luke adds the fact that those kingdoms in which Satan is in charge were handed over to him when, I think, at the fall of Adam. And then Satan is the god of this world, the god of this age, he says, I'm going to give you all these kingdoms in their glory if you do one thing. Bow down and worship me. And of course, Jesus said, away with you, Satan, meaning go and keep on going. <laughs> the tense in the Greek. Keep on going. For it is written, it stands written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him you shall serve. That was a legitimate offer in a sense because Satan usurped God's authority after man rebelled against God. And certainly he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the god of this age. He is the ruler of the world system that's hostile against God. And therefore we need the armor of God to stand against our opponent, our foe. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Ephesians 6 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. This is what uh, Barnhouse called, I have a book on angelology, Barnhouse, Donald Barnhouse, who was a minister in the 30s, he called this the invisible war. Wow. We are in an invisible battle. And the only way we know about the one who is in charge of this is through scriptural revelation. And our battle is not with people. We normally think of we have an argument or have this thing happen or that thing happen. Our issue is this, this, and this, or that person. But do you know there's forces at work that try to distract you, even as a believer, from the word of God. And Satan is behind the scenes operating and moving individuals to get your eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to view this as a spiritual war, a spiritual war. Many times we're oblivious to this because our eyes are not on the Lord. We have to go back and realize, and I can tell you times in my life where I felt the pressure, I felt the opposition, I felt depression, I felt discouragement. I felt anxiety, I felt anger, and certainly it's Satan that's behind those things. And you have to identify it as such and go back to the focus upon the Word of God. But we need to be aware of our enemy. We, tend, we will yield to our enemy if we don't know his, its, his, strength, his strength. Now, we can stand against our enemy. The Bible does not exhort us to take on a uh, 
offensive approach to Satan, but a defensive approach to Satan. He uses the word stand, by the way, in Ephesians 6, stand, stand, stand. You know, we're not on the offensive today, we're on the defensive, but we can resist him, resist him, stand in truth, quote scripture. We can stand against our, 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 po, our, our opposition and our enemy, Satan. But what are the three enemies of the believer? You should know this. This is basics 101. The world, the flesh, and the devil, right? Those three enemies. So Satan is the goddess age. He is the ruler of the cosmic system. That would be enemy number two. So Satan uses the disinformation. By the way, it's promoted by people, institutions, but it's still part of his lies called the world system. So we have Satan, the world system, and then we have an internal enemy. What is that? The flesh or the old sin nature. So we have two external enemies and one internal. And then we have to deal with that old sin nature, by the way. Um, and the Bible tells a strategy directed toward each one of those enemies. And the Bible gives us resources of how to stand against those three enemies as a born-again believer. Now, the nature of the cosmos, this world system, completely evil. Completely evil. Uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John 2, 16. The Bible exhorts believers not to love this world system. And that includes the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. All that is in the world. So what are the components of the world system? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, what you see that you desire through the eye gate, and arrogance. Notice arrogance is a big part of this world system. By the way, that is natural because Satan's original sin or fall was what? Isaiah 14, five times I will. Pride, pride. And therefore, that's part of the, of the world system, all its allurements. What does the Bible say about the world system? It's passing away and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So this world is totally evil in God's estimate. We've got to view things through the lenses of biblical truth because if we don't, we will not see the evilness of the world system. It's godless. It excludes God in its consideration. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Ephesians 2, 12. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and, notice this, without God in the world. Notice, in the world, apart from God, godless. God is not considered, at least the biblical God of the Bible is not considered. You know, we have so many people that's pursuing spirituality, okay? And that could take mystical forms. I want to be spiritual, but not in the biblical sense, not biblically how can I be spiritual? So I want to practice meditation or Eastern mysticism. I want to do this thing. I want to have a sense of belonging. I want to have a sense of devotion or dedication or religion in my life. Apart from consideration of what God requires through Scripture. So you hear a lot about spirituality, but we need to look at biblical spirituality. And the world system is promoting godlessness. And it can, that can seem things that are seemingly good, uh, but in God's estimate is not because God of the Bible, the God of the Bible is pushed out of that consideration. Every unsaved person is part of this system. Third point about the cosmos. Every unsaved person is part of this world system. Uh, John chapter... 8 verse 23, 
John 8, verse 23. He said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. He's speaking to the Jews here, unbelieving Jews. You are of this world, but I'm not of this world. You're part of this system and rebelling against God. Therefore, I say that what you do, uh, that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. They are part of it. And I think uh, we can add to the fact that the whole world in 1 John chapter 5 lies in the lap of the wicked one. The world system is under the sway. And therefore the unsaved are part of this system, whether they realize it or not. False teaching is part of this world system. Uh, again, this is the way Satan promotes his agenda through false doctrine. Uh, look at Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians 2, 8. He's addressing believers, by the way. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Now, obviously the Greek culture promoted reasoning, humanistic, apart from divine revelation. And Paul was even mocked and made fun of. Remember Paul, Mars Hill. And, uh, you know, they, he was looked down upon by the pseudo-intellectuals of this day. And he said, these individuals will try to rob you as a Christian of your reward. They'll try to take you off the track. And God uses, or Satan uses, philosophy, godless philosophy, to take you away from biblical reality. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the cosmic system, world system, and not according to Christ. And he says, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead deity. He's the God-man. And don't let any philosophy professor or system teach you otherwise. Biblical truth. That's what we stand on. False teaching, by the way, is part of this system of lies that Satan uses. Now, what's our relationship to the world as a believer? What is our relationship to the world as a believer? We are not of the world positionally. Understand this. Now, uh, we do not belong to it. We are in Christ, and therefore we're not part of it. Remember, earlier definition is all the unsaved, they're already part of this system. They're hooked up with it. They're in it. Uh, we as believers, though, we're in Christ, and we're not part of it in our position. Uh, John 17, verse 16. Jesus said, they are of the world just as I am not of the world. These individuals are of the world, but I'm not of the world. We are not part in our position of the world system. We do not belong to Satan once we are a believer. Why? Because Christ has overcome the world. Uh, in 1 John chapter 4, 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Our faith. We believe the gospel. In a positional sense, we have overcome this world. Meaning now we're going to heaven. We have not adopted the false belief that maybe through goodness or works or anything else, I can merit God's favor. I believe scriptural revelation. And therefore, we've come out of that system in that sense. We're in Christ but in our practice, we can adopt its philosophy, okay? A person can still be in their position in Christ in their practice, though, being opposed to his teaching. Uh, and therefore, we are not to love the philosophy of the world system. We're warned not to love the world. Do not love the world or the things that are in this cosmic system. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, that's a, that does not mean that person is not born again. But that person cannot love the 
things of the world and love God at the same time. At the same time. And therefore the two are opposed. Jesus said no man can serve two masters, right? You can't serve the things of the world and the things of God. Those are, those are opposites. And therefore we're not to embrace the philosophy, you know, the pursuit of hedonism, for instance. If it feels good, do it. Pursuit of material wealth apart from God. Uh, this can include a lot of things, but we are not to embrace its projects or arrogance or pride. We are not to love those things and desire those things above the plan of God for our life. And therefore, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's every part of our being. We're not to love the things that are op in opposition to God. We try to do both, and we always go over to Satan's side and the things of the world when we try to straddle. You can't straddle the fence. You know, I already saw an old-time preacher, remember, he said you can't sit on the fence because you're eventually going to fall off on one side or the other. It's very true, especially if it's a picket fence, right? <laughs> you're not going to stay on there long. So we're not to try to embrace the things of the world, and maybe I can compromise the things of God and you know, go back between them. No, we're not to love it at all because those things are passing away. By the way, the Bible tells us also as believers, do not become a friend of the world. What does James say? James chapter 4, verse 4. James 4, 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Now, he's talk, not talking here to unbelievers. He's talking to believers who have betrayed God. Think about that. Men and women, adulterers and adulteresses, committing spiritual adultery by not following God. He says, um, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Embracing the world in its viewpoint is in opposition with God. Whoever there wa who there therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, even as a Christian. So we're not to become a friend of the world, friend of the world. Now, of course, practical application. We can have individuals we call friends in a loose sense as far as acquaintances that are not believers. Okay, understand that. Obviously, we are to be a light, but we are not to embrace the things that they embrace. We are not to hold to the things that they do. We're not to run and practice with those individuals. And so there's a fine line. We can associate with people who are not saved. Obviously, we have to be a light, but we're not to embrace their thinking, their philosophy, and therefore not becoming a friend of the world. So this is practically having a friendship with individuals who are part of the world system, but also don't embrace the things of the world, certainly. So in our experiential sense, we're not to love the world and not become a friend of it. And James also tells us to keep ourselves separated from those things. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. Now, I don't like the translation here, religion. I always think of religion as man's way of trying to merit God's favor. Christianity is not a religion in that sense. It's different, distinguished between all religions. It's funny when you go to certain universities you have a class called comparative religions like okay here's christian biblical christianity here's buddhism here's you know taoism here's all these other confucianism you have all these other philosophies and religions and say well this religion does helps the poor and this person does it and so they're really equal you know and they try to try to say biblical christianity and usually though they're hostile to biblical christianity and support these other Eastern religions. Um, but those things that uh, do not line up with the Word of God are part of that world system, these false religions. So pure and undefiled, undefiled Christian way of life, we could say, before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, minister to those who have need, and then to do what? Number two, keep oneself unspotted from the world. Don't be tainted with the world system's philosophy. 
Keep yourself pure and separated from its uh, viewpoint. Now, what does the world think about you? <laughs> well, I can ask, in general, what do you think society today thinks about born-again believers, especially those who really believe the Word of God? We're on the outside, right? We're evil. And we live in society to think that uh, if we have a biblical view of marriage, that we're the ones who are the oddballs. I believe that God created a man and a woman, marriage between one man and one woman. And we, if we hold to that, we're the ones who are oddballs. And that shows you how the world is completely opposed to the things of God. Cosmos attitude toward the Christian, uh, hatred. The world hates you. The world hates you. Um, let's take a look at, uh, I think it's John 15. I was a comic here in my notes here. But uh, John chapter 15. Let's look at John 15, 18. John chapter 15. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So we need to have this expectation that the world will not embrace us. Now, no matter how hard we try, now, obviously, we are to be an ambassador. An ambassador means that we should, you know, properly represent the Savior. We're not to be obnoxious. We are not to do things that directly cause people to hate us. But just living your Christian life will incur, and making a stand for what is right, will incur the hostility of the world system. We need to understand that and expect that. We can't expect that, well, if I did this, that person will love me and do all that. It's like people today naively think that, well, if I just sit down with the Hamas leaders and try to negotiate and, you know, just get along, hold hands, that, well, it'll all work out. No, how can you do that when people are devoted, satanically speaking, to your destruction? You know, <laughs> there's no negotiation there. And I think some Christians think that if I'm just civil, if I don't do this, and there, that person will embrace me and love me. Now, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of Christians who turn people off. Don't want you to be that one. Don't be a noxious person. Uh, but understand still that those people hate you because they're not of Christ. And therefore, they are with Satan and his thinking. And therefore... Many times, no matter what we do in trying to cause people to accept us, we have to realize that if we stand for truth, many times they will attack us and oppose us because they opposed our Savior. What did they do to Jesus? They crucified him. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 14. Jesus said this, I've got, given them your word, he's praying for his disciples, and the world has hated them. The world has hated them, even those associated with Jesus, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Think about that. The world opposes them because they associate with me. They associate with me. Again, so if you associate with Christ, the world's not going to embrace you. Don't expect it to. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. 1 John 3, 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Now, I like the way you know John stated this. I'm surprised a person hates me. I don't. I don't understand. What have I done? I don't get it. Well, because they're motivated by Satan, they don't think like you do. They don't act like you do, and you act one way. They naturally are opposed to you. I find it very interesting, even with extended family, that. You have individuals that are not saved, and you may not mention one word about the Bible to them. You're in a social setting. One word about Christianity, and they come up with the snarkiest comments. I almost said something, but I said, don't return insult for insult. I thought of that verse. 
I'm glad that verse came to my mind. <laughs> An extended family member who made a very snarky comment to me. And I'm there trying to love him and care about him. Very snarky comment. But I'm thinking, he thinks that way because he's part of that world system. I can't expect him to think according to biblical norms and standards or act that way. He naturally acts that way because he's of the world. And so I shouldn't be shocked that he says these things. I shouldn't be surprised. And so, Christian, don't be surprised. No matter what, you might not, like again, not even say a word. Just, you're in a social, you're just there. But you're a light. And they're in the darkness. And so, the, the darkness doesn't even want a representative of the light around. And that's why. That's why. Uh, let's take a look at 1 John 4, 5. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world. This is the way they act, this is the way they talk, and the world, though, listens to them. <laughs> they hear those who are of its own, but they oppose those who are of the truth. So again, hatred is the world toward the believer. Now, what does the world have to offer? Lust the flesh, lust the eyes, pride of life. Think about the fall. When we look at those three elements... Uh, in the garden, we had the temptation. You know, Eve saw that the tree was good for fruit, for, for food, a tree to be desired, to make one wise. And then the idea that she will be like God, pride. So we have really all three elements in the temptation in the garden. We had those same three elements that Jesus, or the Satan tempted Jesus with in Matthew chapter 4. He tempted them through the world, the flesh, and they're, they're lust of the eyes, uh, no, lust of the eyes, lust of flesh, pride of life. So those three things Satan still uses today. Why? Because they work. Why does Satan use the same things over and over throughout history? Because they work. Temptation's still the same. Temptation's still the same. So the three elements are the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those three elements. And... Those, that, those things that, that you physically desire and seek, those are part of the world system, including arrogance, arrogance. Another element that the world has to offer, the world can't offer you peace. Notice that, the world cannot offer you peace. Uh, the world can try, but ultimately, you'll never have lasting peace unless you understand and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who can bring you peace with God and bring and give you the peace of God which passes all understanding. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Notice this next phrase. Not as the world gives do I give you. The world cannot give you the kind of peace that I can give you. And the idea of tranquility of soul, a calmness, a rest in the Lord. God can give you that type of peace that the world cannot. Oh, the world can offer many things that look like peace, but it really is not. It's not the peace that God gives you. So there is no comparison. There's no comparison what God can give you and what the world can give you. And the Bible says, by the way, that there's no peace to the wicked. They're like the troubled sea. They may be prosperous, they may be wealthy, but there's still no peace. Why do millionaires and billionaires commit suicide? Why? They seemingly have everything, but they don't have peace. They don't have lasting peace. And so the world's not going to offer you something that God offers you. And therefore he said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so it can give us the peace of God which passes all understanding but the world cannot. No eternal benefits. Now, there's, there's temporal benefits. Keep in mind, the world can offer you wealth. The world can offer you uh, stimulation. The world can offer you all kinds of other things. But the world cannot give you something that lasts forever. None of, none of that. And let, notice in Luke 9, 25. Luke chapter 9, verse 25. For what profit it is to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Destroyed or lost. 
Now, prior to that here is in verse 24, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And even dress, I think this, he addresses believers who want to follow the Lord. You want to hold on to your life, you will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Seemingly a paradox, isn't it? Uh, you pursue the things of the Lord, meaning you don't pursue your own priorities. I'm going to give it up to the Lord, whatever he wants in my life, his will, his purpose. And you'll find that life. You'll find that peace. But if you want to pursue what benefits you only in the world system, you're not going to find that. It won't be a gain. There will be, in another parallel context here, he talks about reward. I think it has the idea for the believer as reward or loss of reward. The world cannot give you eternal reward. They cannot give you something that lasts or it's permanent, an incorruptible crown. They can only give you things that are temporal and therefore not lasting. So the world cannot offer you anything that's permanent. Now, cosmic systems perspective cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Those in the world cannot appreciate the things that are revealed through the Holy Spirit. And therefore, um, they do not have a capacity to comprehend biblical truth. Uh, John 14, verse 17. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Notice, the world cannot receive the spirit of truth because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and in you. So, this spirit of truth, the world cannot receive. The world cannot receive. And you can reference 1 John 2, 12 and 14. The world does not know the Father. The world does not know the Father. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known you. The world has not known you, but I have known you. And these disciples have known that you sent me. But they do not know. They do not have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. The world considers the message of the cross foolishness. And um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? The debater. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message to preach, preach to save those who believe. The Jews want a sign. The Greeks seek after Sophia, wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. I like that. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block because they don't believe that Jesus is their Messiah. To the Greeks, that's just foolishness that a man who lived nearly 2,000 years ago can give you eternal life and you, he, yet he died on a bloody cross and all that. That's just ridiculous. But those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom of God is wiser, the foolishness of God is wiser than man. God's om, om, omniscient. He knows it all. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh... Not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the low things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should boast in his presence. God uses weak vessels for his honor and glory. So he gets the credit, not man. But you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who boasts or glories, let him glory in the Lord. In the Lord. The philosophers of Paul's day did not embrace him. They thought his message about a Savior who died was ridiculous, was foolishness. But for us, it's God's power. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are empty. 
And therefore, we are not to embrace those things that are in opposition to God. Fourth thing, the world tunes out the things of God. They're deaf, they're tone deaf to biblical truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. We call him the soul man. <laughs> For they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because those truths are spiritually discerned. I've stated this a hundred times. I'll state it 101. <laughs> that the pursuit of biblical truth, understanding the Bible, is unlike the pursuit of any other academic subject. It, it stands alone. Because you can have a high intellect and learn geometry and calculus and Latin and Greek and all these things, which is great. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're unsaved, you can memorize the Bible, but you will not appreciate it. You will not understand its spiritual teaching apart from the Holy Spirit. Understand this. This truth must be pursued with a relationship, right relationship with God. Bottom line. And therefore, you will not have the capacity. And the unsaved person, they quote Bible verse, beep, turn it out. Don't want to hear that. And uh, they do not get it. They simply tune out the things of God. They're listening to a different tune, by the way. The Pied Piper. So what is our strategy against the world system? How do we, how do we attack or how do we stand against it? Don't embrace it. We looked at that already, 1 John 2.15. We're not to love the things of the world. Don't set your affection heart toward what the world has to offer. The first priority is what God wants in my life, not what my friends, not what my family, not what my professor wants. What does God want with my life? That's most important. Number two, keep your eyes on grace and the finished work. And Paul dealt with the legalizers that distracted and got off on grace. I think a lot of people hate Christians, one, one of the, another reason, not only because they're part of the world system, but because they have never been presented with biblical Christianity. They've been presented with legalism, and they're turned off, and they're tuned out. Or the other way around, sloppy Christianity. It doesn't matter how you live. They haven't been presented with biblical Christianity. But God's grace is what should motivate us, and not the world. Maintain fellowship with the Father. It's very important. We ought to walk in light of his word. Walk in fellowship in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. By which we have given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through Lust. Maintain a right relationship with the Father. Live by faith. Faith is the victory that we sing the hymn all the time. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Live by faith. Not by what you can see. Sight. Number five. Don't become a friend of the world. We've already examined that passage. Don't embrace it. Keep yourself separate from the things of the world. Don't even get to a place where you can be exposed to false teaching and believe it believe me it's all over the internet we have to be careful jesus said by the way not to be so open-minded that your brain leaks out have you ever heard that expression <laughs> well, i'm just open-minded well you know be careful your brain may leak out but the idea that be jesus said i'll give you these words here be careful what you hear do not expose yourself to false teaching. If you know it's wrong, turn it off. Keep yourself, and that's a practical way to keep yourself unspotted from the world. And number seven, keep the word of God. The word of God is what we need to keep to stay out of the cosmic system's pool, <laughs> so to speak. So, the end of the cosmos the finish up, it will pass away. 
This world system will pass away. Its leader will eventually be incarcerated in the lake of fire. It will cease to exist when Christ returns to rule and reign on earth. Satan will be bound, by the way, in uh, the abyss for a thousand years. So during Christ's kingdom, his truth will go forth. Righteousness will be exalted. Justice will be uh, exalted during his kingdom. This world system will not be in the eternal state at all. Thank God for that. And therefore, it passes away. So, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that we not might not become part of a system of thinking that's organized and run by Satan opposed to your truth. Help us to guard our heart. Help us to put on the armor. Help us to love your truth. Help us to be careful what we hear. I pray that we might guard ourselves and be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, who promotes the things of the world, walks about seeking whom he may devour. But we are to be steadfast in your truth, steadfast in the faith. So give the believers who are listening to this spiritual courage and boldness in a day and age that has rejected your truth. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.